So anthropogenic global warming, that's human-caused global warming, is what's driving global climate change. So let's talk then about the scale of the risks that we're facing, and then the scale of the response. On our current path, which we think of as a high carbon path, that's if we continue to burn fossil fuels in the quantities that we are, just over North America, and that includes us here in Utah, we can expect another 12 degrees of warming Fahrenheit over the next 75 years. And if we're on this high carbon track, that is not where it stops. That's just where we stop the simulation. If, however, we move to a low carbon track where we're decarbonizing our energy system, getting rid of the fossil fuels, the oil, the coal, and the natural gas, we can still expect another three or four degrees of warming, which is still quite a lot and carries with it quite a few impacts. But there's a difference between these two scenarios. The high carbon scenario is catastrophic, and scientists use that term very precisely, meaning unadaptable, whereas the low carbon scenario is dangerous but adaptable. Another example, very important to us here in Utah, is what's happening and will continue to happen to our snowpack. Now, if you live in Utah, it turns out that most of us who live here get most of our water from melting snowpack. It snows all winter, that snow builds up in the mountains, and then melts during the spring and summer, gives us the water we need. That snowpack is a giant water reservoir. But as temperatures warm, again under a high carbon scenario, we can expect that snowpack to essentially become very thin in the next 30 years, and by the end of this century, disappear entirely. And it's not too hard to understand, as the temperature warms, more of our precipitation comes as rain instead of snow. And so instead of building up in this giant reservoir in the mountains, it just runs off as soon as it falls and goes away, and we no longer have access to it. And there's one more uh, risk that I'd like to point out that is enormous, and that is the notion of soil moisture. Now, soil moisture has to do not only with the temperature, but also with how much it rains. And you can find yourself in kind of a perverse situation where it's even raining a little bit more, but your soil is still ending up drier. And that's because, and all of us who live in, here in Utah know this, if you warm up the air, the evaporation really speeds up. It intensifies. And this is, in fact, one of the biggest things that happens with climate change. As you warm the air, you increase the evaporation so the dry areas get drier. And then... Also, when you do get a storm, you have more water in the air to come down, and so that storm tends to be more intense. That's called an intensification of the hydrologic cycle, the water cycle. So again, under a high carbon scenario, uh, we find that the warming through the end of the century is so intense that much of the United States essentially is catastrophically impacted when it comes to soil moisture lots of our agriculture essentially no longer becomes possible. And again, what we mean by catastrophic is unadaptable. And so it affects not just how hot you feel things, and it's certainly uncomfortable and lots of people can experience bad effects just from the heat, but now imagine what happens when your food production goes down and when you no longer have access to water. And not only all the physical disruption to individual people, but the disruption because people are moving around, trying to find a new place to live uh, that will allow them to survive. There is yet one additional uh, piece of data I can give you, and that's the notion of sea level rise. On our current path, again, a high carbon path, we're set to raise sea levels by about two meters, six or seven feet, by the end of this century, let's say another 75 years. And if we do that, if we raise sea levels another two meters, that will displace from their homes 200 million people around the world who live on coastlines. And it will displace an additional 600 million people annually because they're going to get flooded annually. They won't be underwater all the time, just some of the time. Of course, none of us want to be underwater even some of the time. So imagine displacing 600 or 800 million people and the kind of disruption that causes globally to all kinds of things. 
We've seen the kinds of disruptions that happen from, say, a civil war in Syria, when a few million people have to leave their home and maybe try to migrate to Europe, and the huge political disruption that that has caused across Europe. It's things like this that cause the United States Defense Department, the military, to list human-caused climate disruption as the single largest security threat to the United States that we face in this coming century. So it's these kinds of examples that lead uh, climate scientists to make what are considered typically unusual statements for scientists. Normally, scientists are pretty uh, boring about interpreting their own results. But here's a quote from someone named Kevin Anderson, who uh, is a climate scientist in the United Kingdom. Kevin says, there is a widespread view that a four degrees Celsius future is incompatible with an organized global community. Let's unpack that. What does he mean by four degrees Celsius future? What he means is global average warming of four degrees Celsius above pre-industrial temperatures, of which we have already warmed 1.2 degrees. Incompatible with an organized global community. That's that notion of catastrophic, unadaptable. And he goes on to say it's likely to go beyond adaptation, is devastating to a majority of ecosystems, and has a high probability of not being stable. And I want to spend just a moment talking about this notion of stable, because this is where we start to really understand the risk, as if what I've told you isn't scary enough already. So complex systems like the climate system have what are called thresholds or tipping points, typically. And what that means is this. You can nudge that system just a little bit, and it, uh, it, it changes a little bit, but the conditions around it tend to take it back to where it was. Think of a marble in a dimple. If I nudge that marble a little bit, it'll just kind of oscillate around the bottom and then come to, come to rest in the bottom. But if I disturb it a little too much, let's say that there's a, I get it out of the dimple, then that marble can roll away. And the conditions around that system tend to accelerate it away from where it was rather than return it to where it was. And our climate system behaves very much in this way. In fact, it's the story of the last few million years of glacial and interglacial cycles, the ice ages. So uh, how does that play out with the climate system? Well, the notion is this. If we nudge it just a little too much, we can expect our climate system to end up in a very, very different place than it is today. One that is not at all amenable, even survivable by human civilization. Now, we may not be talking about killing off every last human, and I'm sorry to be so blunt, but not killing off every last person on the planet probably isn't a good bar for success. We want not just to survive, but to thrive in a stable, healthy, vibrant, and just global civilization. And if we continue on our climate change path for very much longer, that becomes much less likely. So the notion of thresholds is sometimes, I use this uh, example of the Titanic. And I think you've probably all seen the, the movie, The Titanic. Um, and if you hadn't, it's worth a watch. Kind of a perfect metaphor for all things catastrophic. And what happens with the Titanic is they hit the iceberg, but it's kind of a glancing blow. They don't smash into it directly. It just kind of scrapes up against the side of the ship. It's a big one. And the crew is wiping their brow and giving a collective sigh of relief because it didn't seem so bad. I mean, there were some champagne glasses in first class that tipped over and not so much more. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet end up kicking some ice around on the deck. Watch the movie. But the guy who built the boat is on the bridge and he's watching the lights on the panel telling him where the water's coming in from the iceberg hit. And he immediately says, we've got to get everyone off the boat. And the captain and the crew say, what are you talking about? That wasn't so bad. He says, no, no. The ship can stay afloat with four compartments flooded, not five. And he can see that they're flooding five compartments. And so from that point on, that is a threshold. He knows that the ship is going to end up at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. No, it didn't happen right away. It took a few hours to play out, right? Watch the movie. But once they crossed that threshold, once they started flooding that fifth compartment, the story was written. And this is very much the case with climate change. So how close are we to this 
flooding this fifth compartment? Well, the basic equation in climate change is really simple. More carbon is more risk. And so if we identify a danger line, we can actually calculate uh, how much more carbon do we think we can throw up in the atmosphere and stay below that danger line. And that danger line has been calculated to be 1.5 degrees Celsius, of which we have already warmed 1.2. Why is that a danger line? For one thing, marine biologists tell us that if we warm beyond 1.5 degrees, we will lose 70% of the world's coral reefs. And coral reefs are the rainforests of the ocean, home to 25% of the ocean species. Between one and two billion people depend on them for their livelihoods and from their food. And if we warm all the way to two degrees Celsius, we can expect to lose all of the coral reefs. So this brings up the notion of risk. And when the risk is huge, you don't ever want to get close to the edge, right? Imagine that you're walking blindfolded and I tell you there's a cliff in front of you. And it might be two feet in front of you and it might be two miles in front of you. Do you think you're just going to run thinking you're probably safe for two miles? No, of course not. You're going to stop. You're not even going to go two feet. Because when the risks are huge, uncertainty is not your friend. And you want to make sure that you stop well before the edge. So 1.5 is our danger line. And the uh, amount of carbon that we can burn to stay below that danger line is about 340 billion tons of carbon. Now, you don't need to worry about that number. What you need to know is that we are going to burn through that budget in about the next six years. We are within six years of crossing one of the climate system's very important thresholds. Now, does that mean that the ship ends up at the bottom of the Atlantic if we cross that one threshold? No, not necessarily. We don't understand the climate system well enough to be that precise. But again, the uncertainty here is not our friend. So we do not want to burn through that budget. Six years. So that's the scale of risk that we're facing. We need to start decreasing radically and rapidly our use of fossil fuels. And how much do we need to decrease it? The rule of thumb is this. We need to stop going up right now and start going down. And we need to cut our emissions in half every decade. And we need to do that for the next several decades until we're down to zero. As long as the emissions of carbon dioxide are not zero, the temperature continues to rise. So that's the scale of the risk that we're facing. As it turns out, only about 20% of the world's population is responsible for 80% of our emissions. And so the task to reduce our emissions falls much more heavily on the wealthy nations in the planet, like the United States, like the European nations, like Japan, like Canada, more so than it does the developing nations, places like Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or Sub-Saharan Africa. So about 80% of the emissions, again, are from 20% of the people. And we're going to touch on this notion of inequitable outcomes a little more in a little bit.